Dr. Nadi, thank you so much for coming through today. As you know, this has been something that I've been wanting to do with you for quite a while. And it took us a bit of time to get here, but uh, yeah. we are finally here. So thank you so much for coming through today. Thanks for the opportunity. It's my pleasure. Okay, so let's jump right into it. So the topic that we're going to speak about today is pain management and all the science that goes into it and the treatment modalities that come with it. Yeah. But before we go into that, I'd love to just touch on um, where did your keen interest come from in terms of um, wellness um, in general? Is there any story that you have or um, yeah, where did this interest come from for you? Well, I think um, what I've experienced with um, uh, working, particularly in the public sector, um, is that you know you're pretty limited by what you can do for patients, you know, just based on costs and availability of treatments and so on. And um, and uh, you know, like pain is a big, 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 big problem, and we don't have much pain management or um, medicines in government that can help us to treat patients properly. But what I noticed was that some patients um, just don't have problems with pain, as an example. And while others, um, that becomes a predominant problem. And when I look at uh, who are these patients, it tends to be those who are active all the time. You know, they, they, um, they are uh, active, and I don't mean just by their job is a labor-intensive job, specifically not. It's but they do um, sports or they do like activities that give them some joy. And they tend to be a lot more, um, a lot less susceptible to pain and health problems in general. And so I feel that, um, you know, that's where that idea of wellness came in. Because it's almost like, if you focus a lot on wellness, um, you're not waiting for someone to become sick. You know, it's like you're doing it, um, you, you are bringing them as away from that point of sickness as possible. So often they can go through, I mean, they can have a fall, they can have some injury, um, but it doesn't affect them as much compared to someone who's sort of, if I must say, the sick line, who's close to the sick line, you know? So it's almost like wellness brings about a bit of resilience when it comes to the body, when it comes to the mind, and so many things um, for a person. So that's sort of what uh, got me interested in wellness, you know? Um, and, uh, and, you know, in medicine, we have this thing called the sick role. And the sick role is what one sort of um, adopts when you are sick. It's like a, sort of a role that you take. And, and often you may see this in families as well. If you have a person who's um, in the family who's suffering from a lot of illnesses, a lot of sickness, maybe severe diseases, um, it's almost like that whole family takes on the sick role, you know, um, where almost the whole family, everything revolves around this one person and taking care of them and so on and so forth. And in that situation, there's minimal wellness for everybody. And actually what you find in, in medicine is that um, if, for example, studies have shown if you have um, siblings and one of the siblings uh, was diagnosed with some severe medical condition as a child, um, the other sibling is more prone to uh, psychosomatic disorders. So in other words, they, they present with somatic body symptoms, um, but it's related to stress, for example. And, and it's not that they're pretending, this is actually what happens. And, and it seems to be because you are only unwell if you have a physical sickness. Otherwise, um, you're not unwell. Mm. So it's very one-dimensional. And that's because the whole family has adopted that sick role around this other sibling who is genuinely unwell um, and they grow up in that kind of situation. Yeah. So I mean there's so many things to look at but wellness seems to be the key where we can reduce our health costs, we can reduce our burden of disease, 
um, and we can improve so many aspects for human beings. Yeah. You, know. you know, what's interesting is it seems like wellness and um, just understanding wellness has evolved over the years and it, it almost, it, I almost have a sense that it's, it's only newly discovered. And when I say newly discovered, I mean in the last decade or so, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not as straightforward as what most people would assume it is. Mm. Um, what has been quite a big um, revelation to you or research that you've come across that you would, um, that would validate the vastness of what wellness actually entails. Um, what, what is that for you? Um, what is that that you able to, that you've noticed in a particular research article? So, um, as part of my, uh, 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 as part of my postgraduate training, we had to do a, um, sort of a, 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 maybe let's just say a project um, that's the wrong term, but uh, something called Community Oriented Primary Care, COPC. And that's about um, actually going to the community and mobilizing the community resources, um, internal resources within the community to bring about better health outcomes. So it's not like um, a professor, I can't remember his name, but um, he's a professor, I think at Pretoria, he, he always says that it's sort of like a soccer match where all the time so far we have been playing defense. You know, our clinics or our hospitals or the doctor, um, doctor's rooms and so on. It's we are paying, playing defense. Um, when someone gets ill, they come to us. But there's no one going out there to play offense, to actually fight um, the social determinants of health. The problems in the, in the society that brings about poor health outcomes and poor health. Um, so it's actually taking a proactive role, one could mm. say, and you go, but the whole concept of it is that it has to be community driven, not healthcare driven. And so that's sort of the, the way you've got to have to try and um, work it out. And, and you find that when you go into community, there's so many um, resources the community has. Um, and it could be fantastic things. I mean, you could have sort of the church leader, you could have a, um, a um, child welfare, um, could be an internet hub or like a, a um, computer cafe. Um, and um, uh, the, the community that I was working with, the, one of the community resources was actually this lady who runs a tuck shop in the community and in a, in a shack. And um, <clears throat> she's regarded as a community leader. And she used to come for, for these meetings, for example, and give us wonderful insights. Mm. Um, and then what I found was when you try and work out how do we make sure all these resources align towards a common goal, you've got to identify what is this common goal? What does this community want to fight? Is it crime? Is it alcohol and drug abuse? Um, is it education? Is it um, you know, inspiring the youth? Whatever it may be. And it's about aligning that together. So in trying to make my plan on how we could do this, um, I thought of um, a situation where the community is very much passionate about sports. And that's where I came across research that showed that um, children who play sports um, from a young age and, and, um, and, and not competitive sports, specifically not just sports as a hobby, as a joy, as you know, yeah. they tend to have better health outcomes throughout their life compared to someone who then starts exercising and doing all of that later in their life. Yeah. And, and that for me was quite profound. It was like, okay, if you can create wellness for kids at a young age, you actually modify the whole course of their life. Mm. Uh, and 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 um, and if you do that at a community level, we have a community that's looking at wellness for kids, as an example. And often, wellness for kids involves physical activity because that's what kids want to do. They want to move. They yeah. want to be stimulated. Um, they tend to be well for a very long time. Mm. 
Yeah, so that, is, that was for me a very, that helped me to sort of crystallize this idea of wellness, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I think the two main things that come up for me as you speak is, number one, community. You know, it takes a community um, to raise our kids. It's, it's no longer this thing of um, we need to do this thing on our own. You know, that's the first aspect. And then the other aspect is, um, raising our kids at a young age to engage in some form of physical activity, sport would be a better option. And I think it's so important because as I reflect on my life, so I was raised, um, when I was younger, I used to play quite a bit of sport. That is my life. And uh, it also, it ingrains this idea of health in you without you actually knowing, because you somehow know that what you're doing is so good for the body. and and you sort of you hold on to that throughout your life and so mm. i absolutely agree with you i think that is um, it, it is quite a profound um statement and research that's come up because and and it's 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 profound because it's simple we just have to yeah. start um at that level and i love that prevention um aspect you know prevent or, or starting at an early age um, compared to starting late in your life so um, I think for the audience here, you know, if the message is start early, you know, get your kids to do a sport, get your kids to be active and, and allow that to be the, the threat throughout their life. And so I think that's a fantastic. So let's uh, speak about pain in general. And uh, the reason why I want to speak about pain is there are a significant amount of people who have pain or chronic pain and chronic pain specifically there's been an increase in chronic pain um, over the last decade so now I know the research is very clear that it is not one dimensional that there's so many facets to this and um, if you don't mind elaborating or chatting about um, where should we start when it comes to chronic pain. Now, I'm a biokineticist and a lot of my clients come in with chronic pain, um, chronic back pain, uh, fibromyalgia, um, MS, you know, all these sorts of stuff. And it's previously we've been taught that you treat the site of pain. Site of pain, yeah. Pre that's, that's been the paradigm for a long time. And now research is coming out and saying, hold on, there's so much more to this. If you don't mind elaborating on what is pain and how we can then start to remodel and relook at pain. Yeah. So um, no, that's a very good question. What is pain? It's actually a very important question. Um, so pain is your experience. It's an experience, firstly. Um, and it sort of uh, it responds to uh, your body's uh, perception of threat, and so that is that, and then th that is what induces the pain experience. Is your body's perception of threat? Now, um, so this is important because some people say, you know, we know different people have different. We call it pain thresholds, for example. You know, some people have pain, some people don't. Um, but and some people have pain and we don't know why they have pain we look and can't find anything um, but it doesn't mean the pain is not real oh it's in the person's mind it's not like that the pain is real because pain by definition is an experience and um, so you, so the body has a lot of signals that come to the brain and um, and and pain is protective if if we didn't have pain um, we wouldn't live long at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think we'll make it past childhood if we didn't have pain. So, so pain is protective. And uh, pain also gives us the ability to, um, it motivates us. Okay, when something is painful, we want to do something to make it better. Um, so a painless life is very much so sterile that you would just not do anything. Um, and so, so there are different types of pain, um, but I mean, however you want to slice anything, it doesn't matter. It's about how you experience it. Mm. But if we look at the different types of pain, 
um, or let's just say signals um, that, that come through to be experienced as pain, you have something called nociception. So nociception is sort of like a, a, a direct pain. You know, if I pinch you, um, that signal is nociception. So that is pain from a pain receptor. And our body is just full of pain receptors. Different receptors doing different things. Um, different things responding differently. So our skin is exquisitely um, sensitive to poking, to touching, to temperature. Uh, our bowel is not sensitive to being poked. If you poke a bowel, we won't even feel it, but it's very sensitive to being stretched, you know. So, so um, yeah, so the, these pain uh, receptors have been evolved. And they go to your brain and they say that okay, there's something going on, there's a threat. And that's important. It's the body's perceiving there's a threat. So that's nociception. Um, then you have the other type of pain called neuropathic pain. Now neuropathic neuro, uh, so it's relating to neurology, the brain, the nerves. That is actually pain in the nerve or the spine. Um, and that is when you have nerve damage. And so that is where nerve sends a pain signal by itself, even though there's nothing going on there. So the brain can't quite distinguish, is this nociceptive or is it neuropathic? Because it's a nerve that's supposed to send and it's just sort of doing it all the time. Yeah. So that's called neuropathic pain. Um, a lot of people have that. I mean, that's when, for example, you have that burning sensation in your feet. Uh, pins and needles is neuropathic pain. And then the final um, one is called neuroplastic pain. And that's quite a new one. So neuroplastic pain, um, it's neuro because it's related to um, the nervous system and it's plastic. So it gives us this idea that it, um, it's flexible, it, it evolves, it, um, it can change, it's, you know. And that is where, when you have chronic pain for a long time, the brain, the center of the brain that has to, that looks at that pain becomes bigger. It's almost like, it's almost like you have this um, increased sensitivity to the area. And we know this. So when someone says, I've got a bad back, you know, um, if you look at their back, the back is completely fine. But they'll tell you, no, I've got a bad back. So they'll just pick up something or maybe they're moving some boxes and their back acts up. And that's because they've got increased sensitivity in that area. And literally... You know, in the, in the brain, you have this map of the body called a homunculus. And you have both a motor map and you have a, um, a sensory map. And, and, it, and it shows us what parts of the brain uh, is looking at what parts of your body, you know, yeah. and how big it is. The homunculus actually changes. So the, the back will become very big for that person in the brain. There's more brain space dedicated to looking there. Why? the brain is looking for what is the threat mm. so it's almost like um, you had an alarm system and it and got triggered right so it got triggered correctly that's nociception and alarm goes off and goes to the center triggers okay so a burglar came and that's happened now you like um, a burglar keeps coming right for some reason you're in a high-risk area the burglar keeps coming Triggers, triggers, triggers. So what do you do? You start to increase the sensitivity of the um, of the um, the sensors in your house. You know, you put beams and you increase them and all of this. Now it gets triggered with a cat or a dog. So this is sort of a neuropathic pain in a sense. Mm. You know, and 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 it goes off. So then it's keeping on going off. And then you give, and then you give the, the, the alarm people your, your speed dial and your gate keys and everything. <laughs> it's almost like neuro, that's almost like neuroplastic pain. Mm. And this is not my analogy. I did a course called Essential Pain Management from Pain South Africa. It's an organization that's dedicated um, um, to pain management in the country. And, um, 
And you know, this for me it really stood out, this idea that there's all these different types of pain or, or signals, let's say, and how we become more sensitive to it. Mm. Now, if we think about it, so our body is, is um, uh, so this whole pain experience is designed to perceive a threat to us. Yeah. So what are the things that make us feel um, like we are under threat? So pain is one of them. Physical pain, right? Yeah. But there's other things as well, and we know this. When we are more stressed, pain is worse in the body. Mm. When there's stress. Um, when we feel unsafe, when we suffer from depression, uh, pain, is, pain is worse. Um, uh, we, went, <clears throat> we went through a traumatic experience um, that caused the pain. It becomes worse. I've seen this with patients, you know, they, they come to us and they say, um, I've been working for some company and, you know, they, they, they're doing physical work, whatever it is, they get injured and they get let go. Yeah. And they carry that pain for five years, ten years, and it's, everything is attributed to that. And they're carrying that anger with them because mm. they are disempowered, you know. Most people cannot sue a company in this country. Most yeah. people cannot. Um, so, so that injury resulted in such a transformation in their life. And they keep carrying it. They keep the anger and so on. And it manifests as constant pain in that area. Mm. So, so that's the thing, is that um, we are realizing pain is so much more than just something physical in the body. Yeah. Perfect. No, I think... This is such an important conversation to have because in life we're all going to experience pain and I think it's, it's actually our responsibility to understand how this body works yeah. um, and this is a fantastic conversation to have. So, you know, there's a lot of research coming out saying, Sherman, just to your point, that um, so they, they took a lot of x-rays of people, people's spines, and, um, and looking at if there's any bulging discs of any sort or um, anything related to that. And they've actually shown that um, a lot of people actually do have signs of these um, spinal issues, but they're asymptomatic. And so what the research has shown is you cannot only rely on the x-rays to determine the reason for your pain. And I think that's a, such an important example of um, your sights, the sights of pain could come from anywhere and it's up to us to explore that. And I think it's a journey. I don't think it's a, a quick fix. I don't think it is um, something that you just do overnight. I think it's up to us, it is our responsibility to go through this journey, this pain journey, if you will, and to figure out what is it that is triggering this. I had a client come in um, about last year, and she had she was diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. And um, now many people are ready, when it comes to fibromyalgia, it's this touchy diagnosis, only because um, a lot of doctors um, sort of immediately say it, it's, it's psycho, it's, it's more psychosomatic than anything else. Um, but anyway, she came in with this diagnosis and we started treating her and she started feeling better just through exercise, but it didn't go away completely um, in terms of her body pain. And what happened was we started having a very interesting conversation and I asked her, when did this pain start? And she said about three years ago, and I asked her, was there any physical or emotional trauma that happened or um, anything that was uneasy for her? And she said her work. And she said she's just really unhappy at, at her work. Um, cut the story short, she then built up the courage to leave her job. I could not believe the transformation. So I saw her... Uh, and that week, the following week, she quit a job, she came in, she had no pain. With tears running down her eyes, 
she says she, for the first time in a long time, she feels as if there's a weight been lifted off of her body. And that for me was a moment of aha, there's something here. And so this for me showcased the ever expanding ideas of pain is something that is so deeply rooted in us sometimes, particularly chronic pain. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to explore those parts of us and to be able to heal it and transform it and recreate it, um, I think is quite important. Now, for a lot of people who do have chronic pain, you know, I'm, I'm sure they're asking, Kaylin, what do we do if we have this pain? Um, and there are a few things that we could start with just to help to navigate our pain journey. What would you suggest um, are one of the things that we could start with just to understand um, a bit more about our, our pain itself? Well, I think often when I ask patients when they have chronic pain, I want, like you, what you did that day, I like to explore it further. And um, almost invariably, there's some stressor in their life. And the stressor can be both external, like a job. I mean, uh, if one really thinks about it, there's no such thing as an external stress. Everything is internally created. But let's just put it this way. You can have, I mean, uh, you could say there's an external stress, sort of like your job or something in your family, whatever it is, a relationship. Um, and you could also have an internal stress where it's your own, um, maybe your own image of yourself or... Um, you know, how you perceive yourself, uh, what's the story in your head about who you are. Um, and also, not just about who you are, but like your life journey or your life purpose and so on. So these are sort of internal stresses. And I often tell patients that, you know, your body is telling you something. Um, your body is telling you something. And that is what's happening. Uh, because... Um, so once you can identify what that is, if you say like, okay, I'm having this chronic pain, I'm having this problem, what is it telling me? Um, is there something that, that the body is trying to tell me? Mm. You know? I mean, look, we have to be um, uh, sort of flexible about it. I'm not saying that all chronic pain is there's something in your life. I'm not saying that. You know, you do have chronic pain Maybe it's a cancer and so on and so forth. Um, but, um, but, but, but remember, pain is the experience. You know, it's not just nociception or neuropathic. It's the experience associated with it. Mm. So even a patient that actually should be having a lot of pain, um, whether it's from a cancer, whether it's from arthritis, whether whatever, their pain experience may be widely different from someone else. I mean, like that, that study you said, there's a study that shows that if you, um, if you took 60-year-olds uh, and you x-rayed their, their, their knees, you would find signs of arthritis in all of them, every one of them. But only one-third, 30% um, would be having symptoms of arthritis, mm. you know? There's also evidence that shows that you'll do a knee replacement and it does improve, but two years later, they have pain again. Um, so, so there's a lot more than just the body, but we mustn't also negate that there is a physical aspect to pain as well, because we are um, <clears throat> embodied beings, so to speak. We are embodied beings. Whatever we are, we know our body is part of that. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's actually quite powerful, you know, what resonates with me now is, and you emphasized it already, is the experience of pain. And the way that you perceive pain, the way that you internalize the pain through not just your nervous system, but through your mental space, that seems to have an effect on the way that you experience pain. And my experience will be completely different to your experience, just based on the way that we perceive it. I perceive it. You know, and I, th and I think this is quite important because it means we have the ability to change our experience of the pain. 
we're not saying that the pain stimuli will not go away, but we can change the way that we feel or respond toward um, the pain. And I think that's so important. Well, I mean, we we experience, we ha we do the every day. This happens to us. We don't realize it. How many times have you seen a bruise or a bump somewhere in your body or a cut, and you have no idea when or how you got it? How often does it happen? And that's because um, whatever is happening at that point in time uh, is far more sort of to you important than that threat. You know, so so. So the actual experience at that very point in time exceeded the nociception signals that was being sent by the place that you got bruised or the place that you got cut, mm. you know? And then that's, so that is sort of, we know this, it happens all the time. Mm. If I sit over there and, I mean, we get paper cuts all the time, we don't realize it, right? But I say, right, I'm gonna do a paper cut on your finger now. Are you ready? <laughs> and I get it ready, oh, and you're hyper-focused. You're going to feel it. <laughs> you, you will feel it. But we get it all the time. How is it that other times we got it, we didn't even realize we had a paper cut until we put some alcohol or we wash our hands or whatever. Yeah. How is that? And that's simply because um, that's what our body's designed to do. Um, I mean, at this point in time, I've forgotten that I've got a watch in my hand. But if I ask you, do you have a watch in your hand, you'll quickly shake or do something and say, yeah, I can feel the watch. Mm. So, um, and, and that's important. I mean, that's, that is what the brain does. The, there's something called the reticular activating system. And that uh, tries to filter noise versus what's, re what's important information and also change in information. Mm. So this constant signal coming through that I've got something here is eventually dull down. Mm. You only feel it once you put your watch on. After that, you don't think about it. You don't feel it. Absolutely. And um, I think, you know, there's an acronym for pain that I came across. And um, the acronym is pay attention inward now. Yeah. That is pain. And I think this is a mind shift because when you realize that pain is only appointed to a particular thing, it is not the thing itself that it is pointed to a deeper issue that you have to look at, you will no longer give so much weight to the pain as much as we have and realize, okay, there's a bit of work that I need to do. There's a bit of figuring out or discovery. That's it. You know, if you, if you, if you, um, if you culture that mindset, that's very, much, that's very much a wellness mindset. You know, when you're talking about wellness and you say, okay, I want to create this well, well life for myself. You look at, well, um, how can I have the best experience of life that I can have? Whatever that best may be for you as a person, mm. right? How can I do it? So you see, okay, well, um, we as human beings are very good with tools, with tools. So what are my tools? Okay, so for financial wellness, I know I can do this, 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 invest, save, whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, for, for physical wellness, I've got my body, so I can do things like exercise to make me feel good and so on and so forth. So we have all these tools that we can, we can, we can, we can say. For, for spiritual wellness, you have our mind, we can read books, we can, you know, have experiences. Um, so when we look at wellness holistically, we say, what are the tools that is available to you, your own resources? internal and external and we need to start thinking about our, as our, our, our we need to start thinking about our body being an internal resource mm. that the body is actually a tool for our wellness that we constant it's something like a it's a wonderful measurement instrument of how well is our life you know mm. and um, you find that some patients for example they'll they'll name they have a back spasm or a lump they'll name the back spasm yeah. They call it, I don't know, Wally or something. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> Wally is acting up. I know why Wally is acting up. This is happening at this point in time. It's true. I have a chronic back spasm um, and I know what triggers it, you know. Um, it's a very specific type, type of stress that triggers my back spasm. Um, and, uh, and, you know, then, okay, that's sort of my body signal telling me, okay, there's that. 
I've made peace with it. It's there. Mm. In yeah. fact, um, when when I, I got that back spasm from um, it was at a gym and I was I was doing rowing and you had this rowing machine that had this game it's like a fish game mm -hmm. where you have this fish that's trying to eat other fish and, and bigger fish that wants to eat you so the faster you row the fish goes higher to avoid a fish and the slower you row it will go lower to avoid a fish on the top so you can keep it's like a game and mm -hmm. I and this was after I did a full workout and and you know the instructor said I need to warm down just use the rowing machine Instead of warming down, I decided to play the fish game. <laughs> and I felt this funny sensation in my back. And, um, and that's when the, the spasm started. Um, and it was debilitating. It started to get worse and worse. Um, it started to affect my work. I used to, I reached a point, some, some point where I, I actually had to leave work to go to physio. And then I couldn't even go back to work. Because sitting there and doing work was just making the pain go crazy. We tried everything with the physio, dry needling, I don't know, those various machines they do, the massage, everything for about one year. She eventually reached a point, I went to a sports specialist, they did steroid injections and so on. Reached a point where she said, you know what, um, I don't know what to do further, I think I'll have to refer you to a professor. And... So I even went to a physio who put permanent dry needles into my back. <laughs> it's like, it's almost like, like, like thumbtacks, you know? Oh, yes. Uh, it looks similar to that. So it just stayed there. I was like, I was so worse after that. Um, yeah, it was just overstimulated or something happened. I tried everything and... Um, I even went on antidepressants and stuff because now the spasm started to go up into my neck. Now I couldn't even turn my neck. <laughs> and, and then um, that is when I decided I wanted to study medicine. You know, I was working, I was doing something else before and, and uh, I always dreamt I wanted to, do, to become a doctor but like, you know, I made decisions otherwise and then I decided, and, and I didn't and then, and now, an opportunity came up all of a sudden, right? This is towards the end of the year in December. And now this opportunity was for me to be able to get into medicine. And my focus went straight into getting into medicine. Mm. For all of 2010, that was my goal. I had to do so many stuff, you know, tests and exams and applications and apply to all the universities. I mean, there's a lot of things that had to happen. Um, not once that I experienced my back spasm during the entire year. Nothing else happened except for that serendipitous conversation that led me to start looking mm. to get into medicine. And um, that's it. That's when the back spasm completely didn't become a thing. Wow. So now it's there and I know what triggers it, but <clears throat> I don't suffer from it. That's it. Um, because my focus completely changed, completely changed. And this, I didn't know at the time, I wasn't a doctor. Now when I look back, that was my experience of chronic pain and how having another focus completely just, mm. it just wasn't a thing. If you, if you felt my back, you'll still feel a lump, it just wasn't a thing, it didn't feel painful. Well, you know, and what you're alluding to is having a sense of purpose or um, having something to focus on. You know, when you're able to, and I feel so strongly about this, is when you discover your purpose, your calling, when you follow your bliss, as Joseph Campbell will say, you, you begin to, um, your experience of life expands in a way that all the small things become um, not in insignificant you don't really notice it as much because you're so much more focused on something else and um, I think for me what I've noticed as well is when I am overwhelmed because I'm focusing on too many things um, at the at the same time that's when my body starts to speak to me 
and then I notice that, okay, I need to now sort of realign myself with my purpose. What is it that I'm needing to do in this moment? What is the focus for me? What's the priority for me? And many times, as life happens, you get distracted and you focus on things that is not as a priority as what it should be, but nonetheless, that's life. But it is coming back that is important and you want to come back home. And uh, I think, you know, for the uh, people listening, you know, ask yourself, what is it that you're doing? And is that the thing that you should be doing in this moment? If it isn't, come back home and figure out what it is that you're supposed to do, because I think that will definitely um, elevate your sense of experience to the point where joy will come more naturally. And as a result, um, pain will be less um because they cannot live um, um to get together. coexist together well i mean i think that's important so like the first thing someone should do with chronic pain is to say why do i have this pain but don't invest so much in why um work out what is my body telling me and and if you feel you're misaligned in some way sometimes it's difficult to make a change but fine why don't we do something else to remove your focus, you know. Um, uh, sometimes it's all that's needed is to remove your focus from a problem. Let the problem sort itself out while you are focused on something that gives you joy. And because not everyone realistically is in a position, if you like, for example, you know, in a bad job, but you need it, there's like, there's nothing else you can do. What do you do, you know? Mm. But that is when I say to patients, listen, it's fine. Make peace with that. Leave it. Let it be this terrible job. Now find something else. Take an hour a day, something, and do something else. And often I tell them that something else should be involve your body, physical. So it's something physical you should do. Um, and uh, like, so it doesn't mean exercise. It can mean going out of your house to a place, right? But not something that you sit at home. Mm. It must involve your body. Um, it must involve others. In other words, somehow giving. It must involve some form of giving. Okay, it can be anything, but some form of giving. And it must involve community. So in other words, when you go there, you're going to meet someone. Mm. You're going to meet other people that are doing well, something, whatever it is. Some form of community. Those three things are very important. And if we just do one hour of that a day, I used to tell moms, you know, in the community I was working, it was a difficult community. And, and you know, so the mom is at home taking care of the kids, kids go to work, then they're at home the whole time, and they don't know what to do. Mm. And they're experiencing pain, they're experiencing all of these problems. Um, so I say, well, there's so much in the community to do. You're a mother, you can do so much. You know, maybe volunteer at a crash or volunteer some, I don't know, whatever it is. So, and in that way, you expand your circle, your community. Um, so, uh, and you are giving, and you're physically going out there, using your body as a tool for wellness, and you're going and doing something. Sure. So that, that is what I feel would be like, sort of, if we say of a toolkit, um, and just a little bit of time. Just a little bit of time, whatever you can afford. Do it either every day or weekly or every second day, but keep it, in, make it a commitment in your schedule. That's also the other thing about doing something in a community. It's like, then you realize people need you. And as human beings, we want to feel that. It's yeah. part of our genetics. We want it. And, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. So people will phone me and say, listen, we need you. Can you come, you know? Yeah. And it's like, oh man. I just got the kids to sleep. I'm like, whatever. Oh, I just, you know, I want to just rest. Oh. But then you still go. And it was a wonderful experience. Yeah. You see. So often what happens when, you, when you're in pain is that because it's, you're in this protective mindset, remember pain is there for your protection. It's your body's sort of threat of danger. But it's over-exaggerated. We, we are evolved to, to, to over-focus on danger, yeah. which makes sense. 
But today, that doesn't exist. There's no line there to eat you and so on. Yeah. So you've got to like sort of, so what does, what does pain do for you? What does it do? It makes you still, you stop moving. It makes you close up. You stay at home, you know, you stop interacting. All of these things are reducing the potential of threat, you know. You're not going out there where a lion could eat you, for example, because you're going to struggle to run because of the pain. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, you know, the thing that comes up in my mind is the, the adage of whatever it is that you resist will persist. And I, th I think you said it so beautifully, focus on something else. Don't focus on the pain because if you focus on the pain, you become a, a catastrophizer and you make it even worse. And what you want to do, pain is almost a signal saying, okay, let's focus on something that actually nourishes you. Let's yeah. focus, focus on something that fuels you, the um, community, do something physical with your body, given. This is the nature of ourselves, of uh, human beings. And I think we need to come to that point again and reclaiming that and doing the things that we were designed to do, which is that. And, and there's another saying, um, that which you look at, truly look at with such clarity will actually uh, cause the thing that we're looking at to disappear. Now, when I, when I say that, there's levels to that. And it is, education is a big part of this. When you are educated on a particular topic like we're discussing today, Will you have the clarity of seeing your pain in a completely different light to the point where you will realize that your pain does not have as much weight as what you previously um, saw it with? And so education is such an important tool as well to allow your perception or your experience of pain to change. And I think this is such an important conversation for that reason. Um, is there anything else um, that you would recommend for people to do, um, whether it's journaling, whether it's meditating, um, and why would, would you recommend for them to do those sort of so stuff? So I think the one thing we must do and we must always um, remember is that we are embodied beings, so we have a body that's physical, okay, and it has its problems. And so we have to look at this holistically. And what we say is you look at what is non-pharmacological, in other words, not using medicines for pain, and what is pharmacological, using medicines for pain. And both can coexist. You know, we often want to say, we mustn't come to a point where we want to be pain deniers, you know, or body deniers. You know, we have to accept that sometimes we do need medicines. Um, but then you must also take care of this other hand, which is the non-pharmacological. So doing something that gives you joy, you know, as an example. Uh, meditating. Um, uh, I, I, when it comes to pain, I prefer... Um, so the research has shown that, that um, with chronic pain, if you do any form of cardiovascular exercise, of cardio, any form of cardio, it actually increases the, your body's internal morphine that it uses to suppress a pain. That's what your body does. Eh? So it's not always about pain increasing, pain signals going up. There's also a control system in your brain that sends down a morphine pathway to suppress the pain. Because right, fine. You know there's something wrong there, but you don't want to experience it 24-7. Yeah. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to eat, for example, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, um, so there is an endogenous pathway that goes and suppresses the pain. You sprain your ankle, it's super painful in the beginning, then it's less painful. The damage is still there. You know, there is already, there's tissue damage. You've, you've sprained your ankle, but, and nothing has healed yet, but your pain has decreased from the moment it happens to a few hours later. Why? There's endogenous pathways. Cardiovascular exercise has been shown to increase those endogenous pathways and it uses morphine. They've actually suppressed, you give a drug to, to reverse morphine and then that goes away. Mm. So it's proven. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is allow someone to take care of you. So they've done studies where 
they had nurses. Um, they compared um, patient-driven anesthesia, so after an operation, you, you click, you know, the morphine clicker to give you some pain, uh, some morphine if you're in pain. So they compared that. Um, they, they compared it to a person who they say, look, that drip there, it has some morphine, so it's going into you, so your pain will be less. Um, and then they compared it to, to one where you tell the sister, I'm having pain. The sister comes to you, gives you the pain in the drip, and lets it go in. Mm. When the sister comes to you, and it's all the same amount of morphine, when the sister comes to you, the pain is half the rest. In other words, it's like you've got a double dose of morphine. And, and so what that tells us is that we, we really feel good when someone cares for us. And we know that our grannies, when we are sick, we feel good when our grannies help us. Mm. You see? So, so, um, so yeah, so, I mean, so all of these are available to us. Um, so so if, the, if you're having chronic pain, make sure first it's safe. Make sure what is this chronic pain, you know? Is it something important? you know, medically. Is there something serious or not? Once you know it's not something serious, you know, it's like what, what we said, let that problem take care of itself, you focus on something else. So what is taking care of a problem? You first need to assess the problem. You need to get someone who's qualified to assess the problem, you know? Mm -hmm. And if they make a plan, you need to work with that plan with them to say, okay, what is the plan? doesn't need medication, doesn't need other treatment. You know, you know, you could actually have a medical condition causing the pain. Yeah. So you don't want to deny that. But then once that is there, the experience of your pain, you have control over by using all these different ways of, of managing your own pain. Fantastic. So, would you, so, you know, going back to the cardiovascular thing, um, I do have a bit of a, an experience with that. And so I, I've always been active. I've always, um, whether it was playing sports and so forth, but later into my years, I've stopped playing a bit of sport and I've only been going to gym. And I must be honest, I've neglected doing a bit of cardiovascular exercises. And what happened was I started developing a bit of knee pain, particularly right knee pain. Anytime I would squat, lunge, I would feel my knee. And um, I would do my rehab exercises because, you know, that's what I do. And it would get better, but it would never feel like it's gone completely. One day, um, I, it, it just, I just thought, you know what? So someone actually said, to, I was listening to a podcast and someone said, the exercise that you're not doing is the one that you should be doing. And I, it just hit me, I'm not doing cardio, so I have to do some cardiovascular exercises. And I started doing that. Within, I would say about two to three weeks of doing it, my knee pain has significantly decreased to the point where um, the other day I was running up the stairs and normally I would experience some form of knee pain and there was no knee pain. I did a hike yesterday. Normally walking down and um, a gradient would cause a bit of knee pain. There was nothing. I was almost cocky enough to wanting to run down the hill because I thought that's how well my knee felt and I did it and there was no pain. And so for me, it just validates that aspect um, for me that, you know, cardiovascular is such an important part in the pain and the pain model. And it's something that we should not neglect. Now, if you have knee pain or any, uh, any pain, and uh, if you can't run because it causes more pain, then you don't have to start there. You can do bicycle, uh, stationary bicycles, you could do swimming, you could do um, rowing, um, elliptical, but walking, you can start with walking, but start somewhere and perceive the change, feel the difference in the body, notice how um, the body um, feels better from it. So I can guarantee you, and that will be the case, but start somewhere. Um, yeah, so we are going to come to a bit of a closing now. And, uh, you know, I'd love to ask you 
a a parting gift what would you, what advice would you or what would you love to leave people with today after listening to the conversation that we've had what's the one thing that you think people should take away from this or oh, yeah what what would that be for you sure that's a good question um Yeah, I would say that um, we spoke about the sick role earlier. And um, you know, often we look at ourselves and we, we also tend to break ourselves into pieces. You know, I've got a bad me. I've got a bad job. I've got this, I've got that. Oh, I've got some good things. All of them are pieces. We need to start looking at ourselves more as a whole. We are more than the sum of our parts. And, um, and if we do that, and we encourage looking at, our, at this whole thing as a journey, you know, as a journey, an experience with all these various tools available to us, I think it can become an enjoyable journey. You know, it can be an enjoyable journey. Um, and, I, and I hope people would then, um, that's what I think people should be doing, is, is just stop focusing so much on this one thing. It's a signal to you. Just telling you something's off, you know, when it comes to pain, for example. But then just look at how the other places in your life, can you add some joy, you know, add some, something there, add something there. Mm. You know, it's all about having the best and biggest experience we can have of who we are. And that's what wellness is about. You know, that's what I would say. Fantastic. Dr. Naidu, thank you so, so much for gracing us with your presence and being willing to share such relevant um, you know science based information that I definitely think will make a change in people's lives if they are willing to do the work so I really do appreciate it and thank you so much for coming out today